Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Durhaj. everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhaj of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Today, I have a colleague, Kelly Blackaby. And Kelly brings a uh, unique expertise, uh, I think a topic that I've touched on, which is basically women in leadership. But this, her perspective uh, is a bit different in her, in that she works a lot of, uh, with a lot of emerging leaders in the Middle East. And I thought it's a conversation uh, that was very valuable to have. So Kelly, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, Roxanne. It's a pleasure to speak with you. So Kelly, Kelly's been in um, international HR, I think, for about 20 years or so. And yeah. working, uh, I think you've been working in the Middle East for quite a long time. So tell us a little bit about kind of your process and what ended up, you know, getting you to the space where you ended up working a lot in the Middle East. Sure, sure. Fantastic. So, so yes, as, uh, as you said, I've been in the um, HR industry for 20 years, uh, was lucky enough to have the opportunity to work in Saudi Arabia for a large organisation um, that's based over in Riyadh. Um, I worked there for eight years and then came back to the UK, but continued to, to support them as an HR and uh, culture consultant. Um, I was one of the first women to be ever employed, actually, within my sector while I was over in Saudi Arabia and then later went on to introduce the first female workforce into the organisation once legislation had changed, created the first female focused policies and still today continue to coach and mentor um, Middle Eastern ladies, in particular supporting newly promoted female leaders who are transitioning into new management roles and female entrepreneurs with their business proposals and helping them to take that forward. Curious, right? Like, as you, you hear about this time and I think in, in different parts of the world, we, we kind of think it's a concept, right? But you've, you're at the, kind of the beginning point where things were just opening up for women in the Middle East. What was that like for you? Obviously, born and raised in the UK, been in, you know, been working in Europe or internationally. What was that like for you um, as a senior female leader entering that, that realm? Yes, absolutely. Yes, it was fascinating. Um, I so I was the most senior um, female employee at, the po at that point, and also the only female employee in human resources. So I ha actually had a lot of opportunity to help to drive some of that change, um, which was fantastic. And the organisation itself actually was was quite responsive to that change. Um, I think in, in terms of if we talk a little bit about Saudi, I mean, the in 2009, so while I was there, only 14% of the um, of Saudi women above the age of 15 were employed. Uh, most of that was in the public sector. So um, in the private sector where I was, only 8.5% of Saudi uh, workers were, were women um, in 2009. And most of the roles were held by men or non-Saudi expatriate workers. But Saudi women make up 32% of um, the workforce now that we move uh, many years later. And there's a huge opportunity there for um, Saudi ladies to join that, um, the workplace. And I think even back when I was when I was employed as one of the very first women, the Saudi organizations did recognize that there was this huge untapped resource um, that was there that was waiting to, to come and contribute to the economy and contribute to the workplace. It was just having the opportunity really to, to kind of access them um so yes it was great when it changed so interesting right so, because we talk a lot about parity you know other parts of the world and you know you come into a, an environment where now like you said 32 percent that's massive uh compared yeah. to when you started um so how is it that um there's a lot of female 
executives now, like you said, in Saudi. What's it like for them? Let's say, you know, from an international frame, if we look at, you know, Europe or or Asia or even North America, and you look at a female executive and kind of, and I know it might be an unfair question, but how do they compare um, to Mm -hmm. other, uh, say, female executives? Yeah, sure. So I think I think Saudi itself has has done a lot of work in terms of helping to support um, Saudi leaders, uh, sorry, female leaders uh, within the workplace. So they have made some great progress. Um, They've introduced some reforms under their vision 2030, which is their national development plan to bring some changes um, to support women. Uh, and they've really benefited. So, for example, um, they've been looking at closing gender gaps um, within introducing a minimum salary for Saudi women. Um, they've looked at equalising retirement age for women, which was always very different. And they've also introduced greater protection from discrimination and harassment in the workplace. So I guess what else needs to be done and what what else is it that, that female leaders are are potentially looking for or still lacking within the organisation. And I think what doesn't exist at at this point is that sort of history, I guess, of that that peer structure for female leaders. So um, they are the very first of their generation and and in history to uh, take these roles. And so um, what we have in other parts of the world is access to Uh, peers to mentors to coaches to tools that have existed and and been tested throughout the years to help us within our positions and that's something which I think having spoken to many Saudi ladies and as I say I I do mentor um, quite a few still at senior positions and that's something that I think they feel is still developing and still still something that's that's much needed in the region. I think of you know again historical context uh, when I was a senior leader uh, and I was trying to kind of go up a level, I would find, you know, someone that could kind of mentor me accordingly to kind of go up, you know, as a level. But this is not something that really has been, like you said, it's a historical legacy piece that they are the, you know, um, the beginning point. They are the four and I, I forefathers. I'm not sure what the proper word would be mm. for they are building history as being the first ones. So that's an interesting thing. So I know um, that you have been working arduously to develop something uh, which would kind of help some of these needs. So tell us a little bit about that because uh, you know, when Kelly and I spoke, it was fascinating because these are things that mentors, mentees, you know, um, allies, all those things are things that, you know, we're continually uh, looking at um, on a corporate lens here in North America. But this is something that really, based on need in the in the Arab uh, countries that you're actually building from the ground up. So tell us a little bit more about that, Kelly. Yeah, absolutely. So again, kind of, I guess, looking at my own personal experience of being a, a female leader within the region and Um, the challenges that I faced while I was there and then as I say speaking to some of the ladies that are kind of going through that transition at the moment and I think there's still a lot that needs to happen for Middle Eastern women and particularly within smaller organizations Um, the larger corporations have been introducing some great initiatives taking some um, best practice from other parts of the world and and putting that um, putting that in, in place but I think the smaller organisations uh, also then still need to make some positive changes. Um, and particularly when we're looking at the entire, I guess, population, women do make up 40 percent of the population in Saudi. So most of those um, women will be coming up now and looking for, for positions in the workplace. So there needs to be some some opportunities for them um, to progress within that. So, yeah. So, as I say, I firmly believe that the Saudi um 2030 vision has put women's empowerment among some of its top priorities and so I'm looking then to help organizations um, in their work that they can uh, they can put forward to to support this uh, this development plan so I'm currently working on an initiative which will be launched later this year um, which will be supported by some of the most prominent organizations um, in Saudi Arabia and across the Middle East and for which I'm also in discussion um, currently with Forbes Middle East as well. Um, So this initiative will help to connect Saudi women and women across the Middle East 
uh, to an asp inspiring female community um, to help empower and support them to develop among their peers and colleagues across the globe. So we'll be opening up opportunities to gain access to mentors and coaching, uh, as well as tools and resources, um, collaborating across the UK, Asia and the US. So it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you said, what were some of the blockages that you experienced? Because I, you know, I would think that your personal lived experience really was very um, valuable when you built this. So what, tell me what, tell me some, or a memorable experience that, or struggle that you kind of, kind of repetitively kind of come up against that really helped you formulate some of the things that you're creating now. Sure, sure. So I guess probably the biggest example was being the sole, the sole woman um, around the board table, um, particularly in an organisation where women had never sat around the board table. So for me, it was really, um, it was a huge learning curve in terms of my influencing and negotiating skills, um, being able to put forward my opinion and my point of view and for people to, some of the men around that table to listen to uh, my point of view when actually the you know, women hadn't really traditionally been around that table um, until that point. And that was something that took a lot of courage from, from my side and a lot of perseverance. Um, and I'm finding that when I'm speaking to ladies um, at senior level within uh, corporations in Saudi, that this is still a challenge that they're facing today. It is changing. And I think, you know, uh, the men and the senior leadership within the organisations are really open now to um, embracing that change and embracing what women have to offer, but it, it's still taking a little while. So that's why I think it will be great to offer women the opportunity to, to be able to, to speak to other women and um, talk about their experiences in, in similar situations and how they dealt with that and how they developed their skills um, and how they were able then to, to become a really... Um, I guess important and really recognized part of that that team. So uh, you know the logical question that I have is let's pretend I'm a female executive in the UK or Canada where I am and I go to a bid let's say a bid you know to a to a board <laughs> and I'm, you know, I've got my slide deck. I've got, you know, I've, I've, mar I've researched everything. I know what I'm going to say. I know what the pain points are. I know, you know, t what my offering is. I go, I deliver, and I'm going to meet objections, potentially price, you know, whatever that's going to come up. How is that different? If we could kind of give us a lens in um, kind of in the Arab culture, how is that different for a female that's going into that context. I'm thinking of you walking into that boardroom sure. with years of history where women didn't have the rights, then they get the rights. Then you're the first, um, you know, non-Arab women, which, sure. you know, probably comes with nuances there. And you go to deliver in that situation. Tell me what it's like at that point. And what, how are you different? Or what do you have to do different so your voice gets heard um, to make the business case? Sure. So, so I guess where that would be different is that um, the culture, I guess, has always been very much that it's very male driven and that the, um, the male leaders around that table are the ones that have lived this experience previously and have the, the knowledge and um, the examples of where they've done this behind them. And uh, so what, where it's different for the ladies coming in is that they really so not only have to know their subjects, but they also really have to be able, I think, to withstand some scrutiny from those male leaders in terms of the questions and the challenges that come from them. And that can be really intimidating for ladies, particularly if they haven't lived through those opportunities or that those experiences previously, and that this is the first time that they've done this, which for many women it will be. It will be their first leadership role. It will be their first um, time of going in potentially to, to put forward a pitch. So I think that's where women can really help to empower other women. So we can really help to... Um, listen to those ladies and, and help them with their pitch moving forward to help them to to foresee some of those uh, challenges that might come back from the rest of the room um, and how they respond to those how they respond perhaps to some um, 
some of the direct challenges from the men who who haven't moved as quickly within the culture as, as perhaps they should do. Um, and I guess really for the ladies, it, it's just the experience of being able to do that and to, to keep strong. So that's where I think we can offer some of those tools and resources and that relationship building as well, you know, building the relationship with their peers around that table. And they need to remember that they are peers. Um, that's how they need to, the ladies really need to see themselves is that they are the same level as, as those gentlemen sitting around that table. And it, it does take courage. Well, absolutely. I would think, I think of the first time that I had my first corporate position and just the stressors around, you know, being able to, to go and, you know, I bring up certain com certain competencies, but still you're entering that arena for the first time as a young female executive, right? And then you're like, okay, I can do this. I have everything that they need, but you're still, that chatter in your head is still there until you kind of harden up to the environment and everything. So I think of um, women from the Middle East and, and the cultural nuances that would be the backdrop and also the men that they are also presenting to and them hopefully being enlightened enough in that context to, to create the space to listen to them and, and, and what the skills or the things that they're delivering as well. So I could see a bit, a bit of a, you're coaching them and, yeah. you know, but you're also with some of the older guard potentially not being um, in the new frame or the new mindset of the new, you know, uh, UAE kind of thing. So I think it's a bit of both. So is it that you find that the younger generation of executive males in the UAE, are they more open uh, to the newer concept? I guess it's probably no different really um, with kind of the, what we've kind of dealt with uh, with upper kind of levels across um, corporate, regardless of where you're in the world. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. So I find a lot of the younger generation within Saudi Arabia, um, also they're educated in other parts of the world as well. So they're educated globally. So quite a few that, that I worked with were educated in the US or educated in London. Um, and they really recognize the, you know, the contribution that women make to uh, the workplace and, and the economy and, and how valuable those opinions and, and input from women are. Um, and I think, you know, well, I think it's really important as well that as this generation uh, comes up through organisations, they can then influence the organisation to be to be more supportive of women leaders. And it, I think it's really key as well to note that in environments where women feel more ambitious and more confident, that they're also more likely to advance their careers. So, you know, the, the organisation is then going to have a very... Um, a very capable person um, as part of their their team and and in fact there was a statistic that I saw um, just just yesterday that women are 62 percent more likely to reach management level and above compared to uh, less equal workplaces so they're three times more likely to advance through an organization if that organization is willing and open to support them and to recognize the contribution that they make and I, I think definitely the younger generation will help to steer that um, as time goes on and absolutely, and women uh, generally have more transformational elements for leadership, which would make sense with the statistic that you're talking. They're intuitive. They're they're able to kind of um, read nuances, or you know, in a in a room um, to kind of understand what potentially people might be. I guess again, the way we're wired, and again, making sense that 62 percent would be at that level. Now, for women, this right, not just in the in the in the Middle East on people that are living mis, listening in the Middle East or even in North America, let's say North American companies that are expanding out in, into the Middle East. Sure. If it's a company that's thinking, I'm thinking about expanding, right? And based on what's happening, like you said, in, in some of the Arab countries um, with expansion, it would make logical sense with the markets there. What yeah. should some of senior leaders think about in reference to expansion out into the Middle East? Um, what are some of the things that they might be thinking about with some of the conversations that we're having here? Yeah, absolutely. So I think some of the organizations, and I think what's happening as well with the 2030 vision is that the government are, um, you know, are actively encouraging organizations and businesses and brands to, to come into Saudi Arabia. They, the country is 
very much more open than it used to be. There's opportunities there for um, expansion of, of brands and, and businesses and services. So it's a great opportunity to go in, I think, at this point in time. So I think for brands, I think what they would what they could offer actually to, to the country and to really help to drive some of this change forward is to come and, and set, I guess, a bit of an example in terms of opening up their businesses there and really promoting their female leaders, including their female leaders within um, working parties, um, within as part of the decision-making process. I, I think they the, the, the history and the culture will change as more, um, as more of these organisations come in and really demonstrate about how much they support women um, at all levels through, throughout their organisation. So uh, it's, it's exciting. I think there is, I think it, the change is just going to continue to operate at such a pace. I'm looking forward to, to seeing how, how it goes. Amazing. And I think that's, that's so right. Like you said, like if you are looking at expansion and you have these, you know, uh, young female leaders and, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm at the stage of my career now most of the female leaders that I'm dealing with they're about 20 years my junior so you're realizing um, how many female leaders have done so much quite young as well and you know now they're the, the you know they're taking over the the realm of of uh, pretty pretty big positions so I think that's really exciting for brands to you know if they're seeing that there's female leaders that want to be able to take on new challenges and projects uh, what a what a great opportunity for companies to potentially offer that so tell me within what you're building, right, for a company listening and saying, you know, you know, we might need the help, you know, to kind of access um, support for female leaders. Um, what kind of support? You talked a bit about coaching. Um, so are coaching um, mentors, mentees, what else will there be? Will there be um, ability to have online courses? What kind of other things might you be offering? Yeah, so definitely. So um, the, what we're hoping to do is, as I say, kind of create this, this network and this, um, this community for women, which will provide not only the mentoring and the coaching and the access to tools, but also um, the opportunity, I think, to network globally. So for an example, um, a lawyer, a newly qualified lawyer in Riyadh can link up with a newly qualified lawyer in the States, for example, to share, again, thoughts, experiences, ideas, opinions, um, and, and talk through some of the challenges that they find, not just, I guess, within um, being a woman within the sector, but I guess the sector and, and their industry in general. Um, there's opportunities to link up with uh, some of the large corporations. So we're hoping that they will be showcasing some of their careers uh, opportunities as well and uh, how what, what it's like working for the organisation. So there will be opportunities there. Um, there will be opportunities for education. Uh, there will be opportunities for qualifications. So it's it's going to be very broad in terms of everything there that women can kind of reach out for whatever stage of career, uh, whatever stage of their career that they're at at that point in time. If they need something, they can they can reach out and, and easily find something that fits. Um, with whatever, I guess, sort of situation they are. So whether they're working from home, whether they're uh, studying at home, whether they're working in a workplace or hybrid working, whether they're a working mum. So there will be lots of opportunity there to, to tap into some of those resources. So not just professional development, but also anything, you know, and I sit in uh, rooms with Forbes executives all the time and CEOs. And, you know, the, the difference is that it's a space to be able to share those things. Like, you know, if you're a beginning lawyer um, and, you know, just the pressures of, of just being in the legal profession, um, but to be able to talk, of, you know, just how do you, if it's corporate law or whatever, and to be able to talk to someone that's maybe be doing 15, 20%, 20 years in, in say, Washington, what an opportunity, what a gift to be able to talk about, you know, the stresses of beginning in the field period, plus kind of the international element and what it means 10, 15, 20 years out uh, with someone that's built a career. I think that would be a gift to be able to uh, match women like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, let's, um, I just wanted you to, I know you talk a lot about um, anti-fragile yes. environment. And I, I just read your article that I guess it was, it is in the 
um, oh, in the economic the, times. Economic times, and yes. I was quite about that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that, you know, the concept of an anti-fragile um, environment and what that means to us just internationally, but even also mm -hmm. what that would look like in the Middle East with them being more emerging. What are some of the things that we need to think about, uh, which I was quite fascinated when I read the article, but I thought, let me talk to you about, because obviously that's kind of where you live. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so anti-fragile is um, it's a really interesting concept, actually, and it's something that I've done a lot of research in. It's a fairly new concept, um, but one that makes a lot of sense to, to me. And so in terms of, I, I think as well, in terms of the level of disruption that we've been experiencing as 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 a world really, as a kind of global nation um, over the past couple of years with COVID, um, 2020, the year 2020 apparently as well has been a unprecedented year for global disasters. So climate change, we've had, uh, you know, floods taking out whole communities. We've had bushfires, we've had earthquakes um, and, Obviously, um, there's the, the really awful as well, the, the war in Ukraine that, that's happening as well at the moment and the, the kind of implications that's, that's, that's had on, on different parts of the world. And I think we can't really take for granted that that disruption's over. Or I think in, in other ways, what we need to do is we need to be prepared to, I guess, really be ready for the next type of, of disruption that comes along. And the concept of being anti-fragile is, 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 isn't really the opposite of being fragile. What it is, is it's making sure that as an organization that you, you grow out of um, the disruption that's happened to your organization and so that you're, you're prepared for whatever comes along next and you're stronger because of it. So I think if we look at some of the organizations that have really suffered um, over the past sort of couple of years, the airlines is, is a really... Um, probably one of the the most visible examples is if if we think about them they are they are a true fragile organization and uh, as soon as lockdown happened and travel was um, you know global travel was was frozen and, and couldn't happen the organizations couldn't move forward they couldn't move so they were a fragile organization their services were were really disrupted by that um, but other organizations were able to, I think, look at what was happening and look at examples of where their organization could, I guess, really could move forward through the disruption. So if we look at breweries, for example, so breweries, obviously leisure, leisure facilities were had to close, but some of the breweries were using their distilling equipment to make hand sanitizer, which was needed across the world. So they recognized that there, they identified an opportunity there to keep their business flexible and keep it moving throughout this disruption. Um, so they were anti-fragile during that. And I think it's a really interesting concept for businesses to, to think, okay, so if something was happened to, a, to us again, you know, do we have enough um, uncertainty within our organization in place to help to protect us and to keep us moving through this period of disruption and to come out stronger so it's a, yeah it's a very interesting concept and I think it's great for organizations to really to really think about that um, because it's so important if uh, organizations are to continue um, to survive and to succeed so it's almost like a malleability test like to take as we we get out of this you know but how, how malleable were we through the pandemic and not wait till the next big whatever, unfortunately, and we would want, not want to ever believe we can go through what we've gone through again, but it shows us that anything's possible. So it's almost like um, creating a stress test for thinking of the impossible, which truly this was an impossibility uh, from a, of a mindset frame and to going forward to say, you know, how is it like if we were not able to like, you know, like you and I in person, all my, you know, all our meetings went online, my trainings went online, I have a, a studio now, all those things that you had to adapt to. What a, a great, you know, it's like a crisis management um, yeah. concept and to, and to put your company under that stress test, even when you don't need it. Exactly. 
exactly absolutely and uh, yeah it's something i think which as as we kind of were just saying really you know that disruption who knows what will happen next so i think it's really important for organizations to to consider that absolutely so to think to think of that in the middle east let's and we're going to wrap up and i know i've you know we've probably already gone over time kelly but if we were to think about that anti stress test out in the middle east with emerging female leaders that's sure. a then edge of the wedge, but that's your that's your playground. What is what kind of things should um, Middle Eastern companies be thinking about with emerging female leaders in sure. the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the really important and one of the key um, factors for the Middle East to consider, which is something again, which is 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 coming in the Middle East, but is still taking a little bit of time, um, is flexibility. So for female leaders, it's about offering the opportunity of, of flexibility within the workplace, so that if there is further disruption, that female leaders can manage um, their the home life as well as uh, working in the organization their roles within the organization. Because I think we do need to recognize that women are still trying to balance um, their priorities as, as, as they have a kind of across the world but the Middle East I think are still trying to look at how this can be implemented within the organizations and as I say I think the large corporations are more open to that and have actually embraced that it's some of the smaller organizations that kind of need to, to understand that that is something that they they will really need to really focus on um, implementing or at least having an idea of how that could be implemented if there is disruption with their female leaders in order for business operations to still um, continue. Makes so much sense, right? Something I think when I was in corporate 20 years ago and my son was young, it, you know, I remember the juggle that I did. And at that point, we had just gone in to the year off here in Canada. Uh, yes. Um, what a gift I felt I got at that time. And uh, after that, uh, was able to go virtual uh, relatively quickly as a senior executive. So which was kind of, we were just starting into that. So just think of with the Middle East uh, to be able to even um, introduce that concept. And I think the bigger companies, of course, because they, they have more ability to do that, they would be the role models for the smaller to mid-sized companies to kind of emulate based on, I guess, you know, looking at the bottom line, truly, really, if you look at it. And I think of myself as a mom, Kelly, when I was able to do that uh, with a young child, um, you know, the gifts that I was able to give back because I was so compu completely available uh, because my mind was clear, raising a family and also working. So I think it's uh, it's definitely something that I, I, I believe that the Middle East will come along, but it obviously they it'll take them a bit more time uh, compared to the rest of the world. This has yeah. been an Thank you so much for your time. Any So first of all, um, for any senior leaders or people or women that are thinking, you know, I'd like to potentially join this organization because I've got this wisdom, this legacy piece. I think of myself, you know, at, at the stage that I'm at looking to give back for companies or even women that are thinking I'm interested and wanting to know more about uh, what you're building. Where can everybody get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So no, it would be fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously on LinkedIn and um, anyone can reach out to me at any time. I'm hoping also as well to be collaborating with the um, Middle East, uh, Forbes Middle East at a summit, a women's uh, women in power summit that they're holding in November in Riyadh. So potentially there to really showcase what we're hoping to launch. Um, so there'll be lots of information there. Um, but I'm just open, really, anyone who wants to reach out and have any advice. Um, as I say, I've got quite a lot of experience in the region, working with organisations, kind of going through this change and helping them to, to really make some positive steps. Um, and we're going to be looking for some ladies, actually, to, to join um, as mentors and as, as guides for women uh, as part of the network as well. So we will be coming out and uh, looking for those those fantastic female leaders of which there are hundreds and thousands out there as well to be part of this this journey so um yes there should be it, it will be an exciting time for all of us I think busy and exciting no doubt I'm sure you're in the, the throes of, of finalizing everything if you're saying it's launching in the fall and do let me know so that if, if there's anything I can do to help you promote it I would be more than um, 
absolutely no we'll definitely be well but no thank you so much it's been great to, to have such a pleasure to talk to you about some of these experiences and how Saudi's changed it's very much in my heart having lived there for for many years Awesome. Well, and, and maybe there'll be the opportunity to come to Forbes as well to be able to share about this, because I'm sure a lot of the CEOs at the Women's Executive Council would be interested in it as well. So for listening, like what what amazing information and for, you know, I, you know, it, it's a privilege to hear as, you know, we work on parity here in North America and we will continually uh, work on parity with women. Uh, transformational leadership is a core fundamental that females bring with them. So uh, being able to expand that to different parts of the world that have not uh, been as fortunate as us, what a gift you're giving uh, to the world, Kelly. Uh, so what what uh, what a nice uh, place to be for you. And for everyone, you know, if you're interested, please uh, reach out to Kelly. But if you're wanting to know about authentic leaderships, whether it's at home or at work, um, what you can do is go to roxanderhodge.com forward slash quiz. You take a really quick quiz. We give, send you some uh, feedback about where you're at and some steps to enhance things. So, um, you know, just do that. It won't take very long and uh, we'll, we'll get that back to you as soon as possible. Again, Kelly, thanks so much for your time. Everyone, I'll check you out. Please check us out again next uh, Thursday at 11. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.